Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. Power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Yahweh. For you repay all according to their work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amid turmoil and uncertainty, there are many sources where we may search for refuge, hope, peace, and security. Competing voices call, clamoring us to look one way or another for safety and security where it really does not exist. We are called to trust in a political party, a politician, a bank balance, a retirement account, our belonging to a particular tribe, our ethnicity, heritage, or history, our background, education, training, or skills, our social position, our intelligence, ingenuity, personal ambition or drive, our health, job, or family. None of these are particularly good at insulating us from the unknown. Where then shall we place our hope and confidence? Amid the turmoil and tumult of uncertain times. I've had the privilege to watch, listen, and interact with people on various sides of our political turmoil, responding from places like Mexico, Brazil, Australia, Italy, Greece, France, England, and Egypt, South Korea, and Singapore as they have looked on from afar to witness the goings on in our nation. I have spoken to and heard from medical doctors and medical students, from nurses, from therapists, from family members, from experts in various fields, virologists, academicians, professors, school teachers, homeschoolers, students, mechanics, wait staff, frontline workers, management, people of all stripes, of education, all stripes of social standing, all stripes of educational background, people of various cultures, races, ethnicities, coming from different geographical and national backgrounds. I've even heard from Frank the Christmas Gargoyle And none of them has the answers. None of them know what is coming. None of them know how we can 
address all the issues that seem to afflict us all at once. In fact, those that claim to have the most answers and make the claim most loudly seem to have the least to offer. This is the norm. This is what we truly expect. We are not particularly adept at fortune telling. And those who categorize themselves as fortune tellers are most, mostly simply charlatans. If they could truly predict the future, they wouldn't need to work for a living. They would not need the numbers of your credit card account. No, we human beings do not understand what is happening to us today much better than we did three years ago, 20 years ago, or 20 decades ago. We do not know how to interpret the signs and seasons and the goings on in our midst. Turmoil and conflict and uncertainty assail us and we do not know how to interpret what is going on around us. We are quick to make assumptions. We are quick to point toward places and things that might provide us a sense of security, a sure footing, a firm foundation. But like as not, we are pointing to things that can offer us no safety, no peace. Nationally, we may make statements about trusting God. But the reality of our lives says that we really don't. Our ambitions, our values, our priorities are too often anything but godly. We may stamp our currency with a slogan, in God we trust. We may put it on bumper stickers or license plates on our cars. That doesn't make it any more true. If we trusted God, our lives would be lived differently. If we truly honored God with all that we are, our lives would speak a different message, stemming from actions in concert with God's will. With all the claims we might make that we are one nation under God and that we trust in God, our actions prove otherwise. We spend more on military and defense than the next 10 nations combined. We don't trust God for our defense. Our priorities are other than the priorities of God. And it matters not which political party happens to be in power. It matters not which politician we elect. We still fail to measure up to God's call, claim, and challenge upon our lives. The psalmist writes from ancient Israel, a nation claiming to be God's chosen people, 
claiming to belong to Yahweh, a nation that lived not according to Yahweh's dictates, but in vain claimed the name of Yahweh for themselves. The psalmist looked at calamity encroaching upon the nation, looked at uncertainty, looked at turmoil, looked at trauma, and he said, I will sit in silence before God. For in God alone will I find refuge, shelter, peace. That is a difficult thing for us to do. For while we would like to claim that we honor and serve God and that we seek shelter and refuge in God, we do not like to silence the voices clamoring around us. We do not like silencing our own voices and taking a moment for introspection and asking God to enlighten us as to God's purposes for our living. You see, we are too impressed with ourselves. We are too enamored of our standing, of our abilities, of our affiliations, of our traditions and heritage. Too enamored of the social, political, and economic structures around us to truly seek God's leadership, God's guidance and direction to truly depend upon God as our all, our only worthwhile shelter, refuge, and strength. In the midst of turmoil, we turn back to seek solace in the known, in what we have seen before. The psalmist says, the wealthy are nothing, and those without wealth are nothing either. Economics is an illusion when it comes to measuring our importance before God. We have a political party that has aligned itself with the interests of the wealthy and another party that says they, it aligns itself with the interests of the middle class. I would be tempted to say that Jesus would be more interested in a party that aligned itself with the interests of the poor. And yet that would not be accurate. For as the psalmist says, those who have much and those who have little on that basis alone are no different in the eyes of God. Jesus' interests are in justice, mercy, compassion, and grace for all without regard to economics, to party affiliation, to social standing, to education, to our skill set, our history, race, heritage, none of those things which 
we claim to be so important make a difference. Until we bring them into the presence of Christ. Until we ask God to clarify for us God's values, God's purposes, God's priorities, God's direction for our living. You see, a a political party, by whatever definition we choose, will never measure up to the demands of God in the gospel of Christ. There is no reducing the gospel to a slogan that fits neatly on our bumper stickers, on our currency, that encapsulates what it means to truly love our neighbors as ourselves. That is not much of a political platform. It's not much of a means to pass laws and even if we passed laws in this nation and across the world that were in concert with the gospel of Christ, we would miss what Jesus himself said about politics, about partisanship. He told Pilate that God's reign was not akin to the political structures, patterns, and values of this world. He refused the three temptations offered to him, one of which was to sidestep the means of God for accomplishing the task of redemption and reconciliation by taking a shortcut through the world of politics to accomplish God's purposes. There are no shortcuts in the gospel. At the end of the day, we are still called to love our neighbor. The one that gets on our nerves. The one we would rather moved out of the neighborhood, out of the country. The one who rubs us the wrong way. We are called to love them and care for them even as we care for ourselves. This is God's call upon our lives. And if we are to take refuge in God, we must trust God enough that we embrace the strength and courage to truly love because God has first loved us. If we can embrace God's presence, find shelter and comfort in being the people, a people loved and redeemed by God, we can then be freed to love others, to care for others, even as Christ has loved us. If we do that, if we live up to the challenge of our baptismal vows, of rooting out injustice and standing against all forms of evil and oppression, of loving our neighbors 
without limit and without question. We'll have enough to do to keep us busy, to shelter us in the presence of God as we carry Christ into the world around us. A living, divine refuge available to all.